You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again, just like we always have a awesome interview for y'all today. Today, we have two guests in the studio. They came all the way from Houston. We have Charles and Vanessa in the studio. I just want to say, first of all, thank y'all for making a trip to San Antonio. I appreciate y'all being here. Uh, it just kind of shows just how great guests are, man. So first and foremost, Vanessa, it's been a minute. How Absolutely. are yeah. you doing? I'm doing fantastic, um, actually. Um, I'm so glad that Space City Frontlines was able to bring me in today. Um as a nice flight, like an airplane ride, smooth, um, no wrecks, no hesitations, right on time. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, and if you guys ever need to travel outside last minute, please contact them. Um, contact Charles at 832-866-8324. Okay. For your next flight <laughs> or your next trip anywhere. Um, I'm pretty sure you're used to driving long hours. Since how long have you been doing this business? It's been about uh, eight years. Yeah. It's been about eight years since we've been doing in the transportation industry. Yeah. And you guys like, what's like the longest trip you've had? It's uh varies. Um, Probably like a eight hour radius. So back and forth, yeah. like yeah. Really anywhere if, if needed. If needed. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was great. It was my favorite team and my favorite sport has always been Formula One, even though I'm too old to be a <laughs> race car driver. Um, <laughs> um I definitely enjoy the speed and timeliness. So I appreciate that. But yeah, I haven't been to San Antonio in like 10 years, dude. Wow. Yeah. At least. Or like nine. It's crazy. So I don't know the city. The freeways are new. They look nice. <laughs> it's getting there. I mean, it's like, it's an eyesore in some places, but yeah, it's, it's, it's slowly getting there. But last time we talked, man, uh, we talked about your fashion and you being a social media influencer, doing a, a jack of all trades, if you will. Um, has anything changed? Because I know you're into horses now. You're into ballet, but you said in the green room that you were into ballet since you were young. So kind of touch on that, man. Yeah. So um, believe it or not, when I was born, my right leg tended to go inwards. And my mom thought, that the perfect way to fix my leg would be to put me in ballet and tap. And so she put me in a private school that had those two programs and it did fix it because ballet is all about this like crazy poise structure that they make it look super easy, but it's like hard as hell to make it look easy. And maybe in anything in life, right? But, um, it it really has helped. I stopped when I was 18 simply because, man, um, I went to a community college and like they don't really have those classes available. They have dance, but it's like contemporary, which is totally different. It's not um, classical ballet. So it's a different format and um, it's a lot more strict. Um, but uh, I went back uh, about a year ago <laughs> And I, it's been the best thing for like my inner child. Um, I think that something was missing in my life. And as soon as I went back to ballet, I felt like that was more complete. Um, especially like channeling my old self and remembering what it was like to be backstage, what it was like to get measured for my like handmade costume, what it was like to have the nervousness and seeing your instructor on the corner of like the stage uh, curtains because um, you always have someone there showing you the movement in case you forget. Remember like Trying to memorize patterns has probably been the hardest thing for me because there's so much going on. Not 
like the mirrors help you. But when, mm. like today, I didn't have any mirrors really. Our class was so full that I couldn't see myself in the mirror. So I had to do like a sideline bar versus like the center bar. And like for all the dancers, you know, you know what that means. And if you get like center bars, you're kind of lucky because you can see yourself right on the dot. But the side is like, ah, uh, there's no mirror. Like it's in front of you, but if someone's walking it, you can't see yourself. And that was me today. Mm. And so then you're testing your feeling of mm. dance. Um, you know, seeing yourself and doing it and seeing your instructor do it, you're more accurate. Mm. Without a mirror, you're lost unless you know the feeling of it. And you have to memorize that. Not just that. Um, every time I think I have it in ballet, uh, my instructor is like, oh, so we're going to learn this variation today. And I'm like humbled all over again. And I'm like, oh, and like today I was like, I have Tourette's. Like <laughs> I was just like not getting it. And it wasn't. And the weirdest thing is that there's a lot of breath work, center work, um, like a meditation. You have to ground yourself. So like you're graceful while you're doing it. When your energy is not that, and it's like high pace, it shows in your dance. Mm. Same thing for horse riding though. So like, I have to be centered on the horse. I have to know where I'm going. So my eyes obviously control the rest of my body. And it shows like, if I look to the right or to the left, the horse literally feels it. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm trying to jump over something and I'm not focused on that jump, he will literally steer to the direction of where I'm jumping. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm fearful about something, he's going to feel it. And I say he because I really have only ridden like male horses. I haven't done a mare, which I'm not opposed to it. But in my experience, like... So far as in wanting to learn how to jump equestrian style, which is like an English way of doing the saddle. Um, it, it is very connected to ballet. I mean, you're also, you know, lifting the horse, like my instructor would say. So, um, in ballet, we're always lifting to higher, looking above, you know, to the sky. Same thing with the horse, it's to the sky. Um, but the energy is so needed. You have to be super confident in both of those sports. You like fake it till you make it. And then you like realize you're like, okay, okay, I can do this. And so you start building on that, which is great. Um, but yeah, I still do fashion. I mean, and anything that I carry <laughs> um, with the grooming stuff um, for the cats and dogs, mm -hmm. I make them like, you know, custom collars and like add accessories and things like that, which um, the pet parents definitely love and appreciate because it's one of a kind. Mm -hmm. um, Passionate about that. Yeah, yeah, it's not wholesale. It's... um one and done, um, which I've always preached about. I know a lot of people have been against me with that. Um, I know that's not something, um, that we still have to work on how to create that, right? In mm -hmm. fashion, because we have the technology, it's just pricey. You know, like wholesale would make more sense to save a buck, but then it's like, ah. Uh, it's no longer that unique. I mean, you can try to make that, but it's something about handmade things or custom things that people enjoy more because um, it's personalized to them. So I try to get to know the pet parents. I try to get to know the dog. I look at, obviously, like their coat color, what breed they are, um, what would look nice. And then I emphasize on my own style. You know, so I've been very blessed um, to have, which I don't think that they can be doing this, but um, the Chanel reps, mm -hmm. you know, at the kiosks and stuff, like, you know, uh, I buy a certain quantity and then I get ribbon, you know, and I use that ribbon for the dogs or the cats. And I uh, just like plead it over because who isn't going to get excited with, you know, something wrapped up? gifted, looking beautiful, 
right? Uh, unique. Mm -hmm. So, and then, of course, it's not a knockoff. So, that's even better. But yeah. Once again, let's not refocus Ray talking to our special guest, talking to Charles and Vanessa in the studio all the way from Houston. I got to say I threw the whole show because I, I have much respect for y'all for doing that uh, here today. I want to go back to the uh, part where you're talking about the ballet because for our listeners, we always want to go into in radio, the air of the mind. Where's, what's the name of this place in Houston? Because if someone's in Houston, they might want to try that. Wow. So it's actually the Houston Ballet. Okay. Yeah, where you go to the theater and you watch the actual, it's right across the street. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're an adult and you just want to try ballet, you just said, hey, I've never done it. It's totally fine. Never done dance. Totally fine. They have beginner drop-in classes. They also have a multi-series where you can choose from where it's intro before beginner ballet. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's intro two which you build from intro one, and then you can start taking beginner. Because beginner is more like you've done it before, you just like need a refresher. Yeah, refresh, yeah. But like intro is like specifically catering to like positions. What is first? What is second? What is third? How do we move? How do we breathe? How do we... Um, and I love their instructors. Like... Intro is Lindsay, and she's my favorite, and she knows it. Like, she's going to be fabulous forever. How many people are in the class? Or in, oh, in man. You, I mean, if you're, <laughs> it's small, but it's not. Um, there's literally at least 15 people in the class minimum. At a lower date, there's like 40. Wow. When you're 40. Back. So is is a that today day. I couldn't see myself in the mirror and we just had too many people. Mm -hmm. You wow. know, that's yeah, dedication. But I mean, there's there's women there that are like seventy five, and they're still doing it, and that's like motivation to me. It's like you never stop learning. I don't care how old you are. So how does that process work? Someone listening right now, do they just uh, show up? They sign so you up. You have to like register online, gotcha. obviously, and then pay. But their drop in classes are only twenty bucks. Um, now, if you want to do the multi-series, it's like 200 and above, right? Um, then they also have a college there for people who want to take it professionally or have been doing it for a long time. I mean, we're probably like top three in the nation. So we're pretty popping. <laughs> um, the directors there are amazing. Um, the shows, if you don't want to go, they're, they're just astonishing not just fashion wise, because fashion incorporates into ballet quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Like your point shoes, um, yeah, they customize that to their foot. Gotta talk about your fashion because last time we spoke, uh, we kind of discussed the credit process and the people that you've been able to uh, style for. Kind of touch on uh, just all you do in the fashion world because it's not like you just pick pieces, or whatever. Like you actually into sewing and all that. So, what is the career process for you? Um. So I'm obviously really, really always have been inspired to have more of an English British style to my, th you know, my items. I've gravitated towards Chanel. And what she's done, um, especially as a single woman, I like her story. She was an orphan. Um, yeah, I think it relates to a lot of women today in society. You know, just she didn't have a father figure. It's not that I don't, but I admire the fact that she strived for that. She was really inspired by the orphanage that was black and white, which is our nun colors, um, purity. God, spirituality. Um, and she actually fell in love with an equestrian <laughs> who died in a car wreck. So, and then she never engaged with anyone else. She met Carl Lagerfield and that's who really like made it more spontaneous and fun in which I also love him as a designer. So when I first started grooming, I came in with my fashion mind 
and a new patterns, right? Like you cut stuff through patterns. If you don't know how to make something, you have a layout already and that's how we learn. You know how to stitch things and how big and it's a pretty much a standard anywhere like, okay, it's going to be an inch and a half seam, like always, kind of things like that. And so I picked that up and when I would look at dogs, I looked at them like patterns because that's what it is, right? And um, I just try to use the same hands that I use for sewing handmade or machine um, with clippers or with shears. So we use shears in fashion as well. Some are serrated, which, you know, cut very nicely. There also are serrated shears in grooming. This is just uh, go over my man, head. Man, it's so, <laughs> it's so, it's like Edward Scissorhands. Yeah. Like, you know how he like carved out stuff like, you know, uh, the, out of the bushes and things like that or the ice cubes. It's the same thing. It's the same concept. You're just, you're using different tools because you're using a different matter mm-hmm. it's a different texture um, but it's the same concept every time and so if you have an eye you start to see shapes you start to see circles and or ovals or like you know uh, rigid lines straight lines or whatever it might be and you have to accommodate it to the body of the dog um, when you cut fabric for a person a human being you're doing the same thing you're accommodating to what makes them look great so if I have a dog that uh, unfortunately might have shorter legs than his sister, his sibling who has longer legs, then I accommodate the haircut to make him look taller if that's what the client wants. If they don't care, you know, whatever, it's whatever they want, right? But if I have creative freedom, that is my job is to make them look more appealing. It's like when you make a garment, you, you're you wanting to make your client look more appealing and, and graceful. And these colors look great for you. Same thing. I accessorize the dogs on the feeling and what I think would make them look better. Um, I also like to, you know, using like high end products on them because it does make a difference. It's hair. You know, we all care about our hair, especially women. Um, but, um, it, the shampoos you use make a difference. If you know your hair texture, if you know what is what you're lacking, like, do you need, you know, more serum in it? Is it too dry? Is it too oily? Is it, um, I look at the hair of the dog the same way. Um, and then I accommodate. So I almost feel like I'm practicing the same things, which is with like slightly different tools, but those tools can be used on humans. Um, but I, I think it's great. I think the clients love it. Um, I think the dogs can feel it. Mm-hmm. Like the, almost like the, the pampering of it all. They, to- they look totally different. Yeah, also, yeah, right? yeah. They, I think From they feel totally after. different too. Mm-hmm. I think it has, just like us, like when we go get our nails done, we're being pampered. We're being massaged. We're there, you know, using certain lotions on our on our skin, and so um, the dogs end up falling asleep in my hands while I'm cutting their hair or blow drying them. I believe in different machines, just like different machines cut differently, sew differently. Some are oil based. Some are um, more at home, electrical. You know, don't need oil, and so it just depends on what you're trying to achieve, but I'm grateful to have all of that and apply it. Once again, listen, I'll be focused right here. We're talking to our guest today, Charles and Vanessa, all the way from Houston. We have to get in the story because this is going to air. I can't say uh, what stations you've been on, but you've been on other uh, platforms as well. You've been on a sitcom about Johnny Manziel back in the day. What is it like to have opportunities to, you know, just kind of showcase yourself as not not just a social influencer, but someone that is branding themselves out there in the world? So I was fairly young when that started and agencies like Barbara's on, Neil Hamill were already um, in the works for their branding and they had top clientele. So I'd go in and they would direct it. It was fun. 
absolutely fun. You meet people who are like you in these environments um, and who are ambitious and are taking them some seriously with acting or modeling or whatever. My Acting and modeling go to hand in hand, guys. Mm-hmm. You can't model if you don't know how to act. You know what I mean? You have to show expression. You yeah. have to be sad, happy, fearful, sexy, fierce. Whatever it is that they're trying to project for their ad, you have to channel that and know your angles. And so they were really good about coaching us. Um, they were fantastic about feeding us, giving us drinks. We had breaks. We had retakes. It's a, it's an, it's a wonderful professional environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't until I started doing stuff like urban wise, which would be outside of the agency that they wouldn't technically approve, right? Mm. Um, that you, I guess I like learn knowledge about like why branding is so important. Um, especially like you really need to know what you, how you want to brand yourself. And it's, it should always be, very clean and cut mm-hmm. and uh, kid friendly. Uh, this should get you the like the biggest gigs. I'm not saying like don't be an individual out there, you know, showing your artistic side, but like um, certain things will not get you like the billion dollar contract that you're really seeking for like a certain brand. So it just depends on what you want to do. Um, but I doing that, it was fun. It was fun. It was, we were, were literally just eating popcorn, throwing it out there, cut, do it again, you know, for him, cheering him on. It was fun. The people were fun. The environment was fun. It was clean. And then you get your, your tax payment, you know, where you need to report this to your taxes at the end of the day in your check. So I would do it all over again, except that I probably would not do the things on the side. I would have gone for like high end, high fashion. Um, but urban at the time was paying a lot more hourly. And I said, sure, why not? Let me just venture out for myself. But I was so young. And then I was trying to do it without an agent. And I think like someone mentoring you that knows your vision and knows yeah. someone you can trust definitely would have, would have helped. Um, but I feel that now with my horse riding, you know, I feel like my instructor, she gets me. I think we can have fun together. And I feel like she also knows where to push my buttons and how, where I can refocus. I like that. And with that said, Everything you said uh, moments ago is perfect because uh, everybody has defined uh, the process and what works and what doesn't work and being able to make those adjustments along your journey. When you started, check those mile markers, you know, where you were to where you are today. Um, What excites you the most with the future possibilities of your fashion world and all the other things that you're tapping into? Man, those are things that I love to do, that I do on my free time. It's such a privilege for someone to be like, can you make me something like this? And, I, and how much is it? Uh, and then you're like excited because you love to do it. And so you do it and then you get paid and it's like, oh, this is fantastic. And then you see that pay increase and increase or that demand. And like right now in my grooming world, I really don't have spots open the whole month. That's good. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. But it's also overwhelming because yeah. I don't want to leave anyone out. Mm-hmm. And I and I want to cater to everyone the same. But like I'm human. And like I can only consume so much caffeine. Yeah. You know, before I'm like, I'm gonna crash. And so like I'm teaching right now how to groom. Like wow. but and that is hard. Mm-hmm. That is hard. I've never repeated myself so much. And have, so I respect my instructors when they do that with me. It's almost like, okay, I get it. I get it. Something within me is a little stubborn and is obviously not used to that movement or that idea or that feeling of doing it, a let go, right? And then you do it and you're like, okay. It's almost, it's rewarding when your instructor is like, yeah, you got it. 
And so I try to remember that when I'm teaching grooming, like, yes, even if it's not perfect, the movement. Mm-hmm. Now instruct it. And, and that's where I've learned, like, you have to build on what you're doing. Every time you go to class, you have to build on what you learned last week. You have to build on, you have to keep, so you have to be consistent in yeah. whatever you do. You it's can't fast. just like give up, you know, and if you've reached perfection, you're done. That's mm-hmm. it. You've literally said, I've tapped out. There's nothing else to learn. And that's horrible because there's always room to learn. Technology is changing all the time. Products are changing all the time. The brushes change. The shears change. We learn new things in health. You know, like they were drying dogs outside in the heat beforehand using oak, like the yolk from the egg Mm. to like condition them. Like that was the conditioner was the yolk from the egg and then like rinsing them. And then so the curly coat was like prominent. Now we've learned about brushes and stretching out that hair and making it straight. Same thing for humans. Like it just keeps evolving. And I think the biggest downfall is not to be open to like something new or a new style or or try. We want to be traditional And we want to keep things a certain way, absolutely. But you have to let room to grow and to be receptive and to be open-minded. Like, hey, um, let's just try it. You know, let's just see what this does. Um, Because I think that's also another downfall in a lot of things that I do is that some people get caught up in criticizing their own work without letting themselves, like, pat themselves on the back and be like, hey, I'm just learning. Because, like, no one's born perfect. No. You don't like you have to learn how to walk, right? You crawl before you walk. If anybody runs before they walk, that's right. Not normal. It's insane, right? <laughs> right? Right? We're not. What is it, Malcolm Phillips or whatever, like Olympian? Like I just, I. It's the same thing, and people forget that all the time. And I can feel that sometimes when I'm doing ballet, like from the when we get a new pattern, and I'm supposed to go right, I'm totally fine and confident because I use my right side all the time. When we switch it over to left. I understand it in a slow motion and then I'm like, nope, I gotta, I gotta see that one, two, three, four, five, ten times more mm-hmm. to get my left side of my brain, which is my right side, right. right? Of my brain to do my left, uh, and to do it on the left side because I don't, I don't do enough on my left every day. My right side picks it up like nothing because I use my right hand. I use my right leg all the time. They're dominant. But if you're not right-handed and you're going to do something left side, to me, I struggle with it more because I don't use that side enough. And so now I'm switching it. Sometimes I've noticed when I'm just going in and I'm just trying to have fun, it's easy. I don't care like what anyone thinks. Um, I just go in and I'm just, it's it's fun. But when I'm too critical, it, st- it blocks my learning curve. Mm. And then I don't, I don't have the same energy. And so then I'm like, oh, this is fear kicking in. And I can sense it and I can hear it and I can feel it. And then I'm like, next round, you got to go. And I have to push myself that way. Because if not like... I've seen a lot of girls quit. Yeah. Well, you've been listening to Ivory Focus already. We are flat out of time. You've been in the studio here in San Antonio talking to our guests. Today, we have Vanessa and Charles in the studio all the way from Houston. Before we sign off, I need Charles to get on the mic real fast. How can people contact you if they are interested in learning more about your business, man? Yeah, they can contact me on cell phone at 832-866-8324 for any transportation or um, private rides for events. That'll be a good contact. Again, at 832-866-8324. Perfect. And once again, I want to thank you both for being in studio. But before we close officially, Vanessa, how can people... uh, stay in contact with you and any social media? Um, so my main page is going to be at Miss MS dot Vanessa, V-A-N-E-S-S-A, Gamez, G-A-M-E-Z. Um, my Orta Couture's, which is I'm a standard poodle breeder. I will have, be having another litter in about a year um, with a phantom poodle. Um, and that's Orta 
O R T A underscore Couture um, Poodles underscore. So you can follow me there. I will have a website by then for them. I just took it down now because I don't have any inventory for dogs, unfortunately, um, with showing and training. Um, and then, of course, the grooming. But you guys can follow me on both social media platforms. Well, like always, just like we tell all our guests, I want to say thank you both for your time. Thank you.